Maybe that might be in poor taste. I don't know. We'll see today how today goes. We are live. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in, whether you're doing it live or whether you're doing it on uh, on a recorded version afterwards. So whether you've got audio through iTunes, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Um, today, awesomely, we put out the bat signal for an emergency and <laughs> and uh, Kristen DeBrooker answered. Thank you very much for jumping on at such late notice. I really was late notice, guys. I jumped on like Friday. I was like, oh, my God, we've got this thing we've got to talk about and we think you're the perfect person to do it. And she yeah slotted us in so thank you for very much for coming on my pleasure i, I love talking to you guys and this is something i'm really passionate about so it's a big awesome. topic yeah it is really big topic we thought we wanted to we didn't want to skirt around it and ignore it and jump into it so for to give people context as to you know what we wanted to talk about a little bit tonight um as well as anything else that crops up and all the other cool stuff to do with jiu-jitsu was obviously in the UK, um, if you're a UK listener, you'll know about this, but if not, if you're international, there was um, a really horrific murder um, in the last week or, or probably a bit longer ago of a young lady called Sarah Everett, and she was unfortunately murdered, what seems quite brutally, by um, uh, a gentleman who worked in the police force, was off duty, um, and um, they've just gone through the whole process of finding her body and things like that, and it is horrific. Um and it's caused kind of a big uprising in the UK um, all over the place on social media. There's sort of demonstrations tonight in London as well. Um, big crowds in London tonight. Um, so this is very timely as well of bringing up women's issues in general around safety and the whole kind of spectrum of those issues, whether it be um, sort of rape and assault or bad treatment by men in general. Um, or violence against women and the the breadth of the experience of women in general with these problems. So um, that's kind of the background context to what we're talking about tonight. And then um, we just want to give a perspective from uh, from jujitsu practitioners. Um, but obviously, we didn't want it to just be a male voice talking about that because you know there's going to be certain things that we're possibly not qualified for. Um, so. <laughs> Um, we wanted to get someone's opinion who teaches a lot of self-defense right across the spectrum um, and obviously being being a woman as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. Cool. There you go. That's, that's kind of the background for everyone. So we, wanted, we don't want to make it too heavy, but like I say, we want to talk about the ways that self, you know, self-defense can empower and can help. And it's been criticized a little bit recently that possibly there's no point because... Um, you know, a woman's not going to be able to defend herself against a man regardless. And actually, as Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, we know that there's a lot you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so yeah, fire it over to you a little bit to start with. We'll kick off. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we discussed this like before we got started, but the big thing is, I think I articulated this, is that I don't want to be misconstrued. So when I first started teaching self-defense before I even got in Jiu-Jitsu, I've been doing women's self-defense seminars since I was like 19 years old. Um 20, 19 years old. And I got criticized when I was teaching self-defense at an all girls school for like uh, possibly making survivors and turning them into victim blaming because like, oh, you could have prevented this. Um, So what we're doing is we're not trying to prevent per per se is mitigate risk. And then also, as I like to say, it's not your responsibility, but as I say, it is your right to defend your body, your family and your property. And that's, that's the idea, the way I look at it. And so my goal with self-defense is not so much to tell women, oh, you can prevent this from happening is to give with like use self-defense as a vehicle for confidence for women to set clear boundaries and feel like they can say something. Because I've, I've talked to many women who have been in very uncomfortable situations and know that it's uncomfortable. Like they know they get that feeling in their gut, that gift of fear, because women have that, that intuition to know this is wrong this is, I'm uncomfortable in this situation, but they don't have the confidence to articulate or assert themselves to say, no, this is wrong. Cause no is a one word complete sentence. And a lot of women are afraid to say that because of the fear of physical repercussions. Like one woman said to me, what's stopping a guy from just flat out, just decking me. Like even at a party in a very casual setting, not even a serious situation where you're talking about a brutal murder of a woman you know what i mean which is actually like really true violence we're talking about just even in uncomfortable situations and that is the biggest thing that i try to tell women when i teach 
whether it's girls, teenagers, college students, or grown women, whether I'm teaching all of them, I rather be um, respected than liked. And that's really hard for women in the culture that we live today. Unfortunately, that's a cultural thing. That's not even training. And so that's why I tell all women is like, it's better to be respected than liked. So if I have to set a boundary that makes people uncomfortable and makes me come off as, can I cuss here? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, can I cuss here? Okay, so I just want to cuss. If it makes me come off as a bitch, I'm totally okay with it. I'm totally okay with it. If I come off like a bitch, I'm totally okay with it because I'd rather be safe. And it's and that's just because it's not because I'm scared of people. It's because I have to trust this feeling because that's what self defense actually gives you. Is this a like where am I feeling the yellow? Like I'm if I'm green if I'm at a green I'm at home. My doors are locked. I have a door jam. I have, you know, I'm, I'm in the States, so I'm armed. Like, you know what I mean? And I'm home. I'm safe. I feel good. But the moment I leave my apartment, I'm at a yellow. Mm-hmm. I'm immediately assessing that where's my threats. And it's not like I'm paranoid. It's just, it's the reality of the world we live in. I wish we lived in a world where everything was peachy and whatever. Like I told you guys, like, I don't think that people should hack into my computer, but I put antivirus software on my computer. I wear a seatbelt when I drive my car. I wear a helmet when I ride a bike. It's just preventative maintenance. Now, do I wish that women didn't have to live in this world where there is, there is not a physical equality to all men and all women? That, that, that is a statement of fact. Yep. Unfortunately, that is a statement of fact. I'm not trying to, but what, we, what you can do as a woman is use self-defense and train it as a way to empower yourself internally outward, not outwardly in. So by walking with a certain command of presence and setting clear boundaries, just in a casual setting before it accelerates or snowballs into a violent confrontation, use a lot you can do. And also I try to articulate to women, this is not a fight, this is violence. So a fight and violence are very different. Fight is like two guys at a bar, like, hey, dude, I don't like your face or you looked at my girlfriend funny. And that that's still a fight. That might as well be a glorified contest fight in the street, mm. you know? And that's two guys trying to win, whether it's MMA or a street fight. Violence is someone is trying to do me irreparable harm and end my life or do a violent act against my will, mm-hmm. okay? My goal at that point is not to win, but to survive and leave the situation relatively unharmed. And that's what I try to articulate to people in self-defense centers. The goal is not to win because then yes, there is no way, like I'm, I'm a very, I'm very good at what I do. The male equivalent of what I do and what I train is always going to beat me in a fight. Mm-hmm. Now, if this is a violent encounter, I, my goal is just to get away. I can get away. I feel pretty confident about that. Like I can escape relatively unharmed. And so that's like the big perspective shift as far as self-defense is concerned. I think people think of self-defense as not what it is. Like it's like, you know, death touch and like, you know, some sort of pressure point. And then like magically the guy just falls over versus like, it could just be like a risk grab escape. Just making yourself a not easy target. Like making yourself difficult to get up with or just like, you know what I mean? Like just something as simple as that. And just getting away. Yeah. The, yeah. Like, it's probably a terrible analogy, but I'm listening to you talk. It's like, you know, the, the National Geographic um, videos of the, the, the lion trying to take down a wildebeest or, or a zebra. You don't want to be yeah. the slowest one or the weakest one or the one that looks like the weakest link. You want to you wanna look like a, a, a harder target. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I, I don't like that women have to be that way. Like, I wish... Like I've asked women flat out, how many times a day are you scared? And they say three, four times a day. And that's something that I think men, if they just listened to that and really understood, because there's a, there's a little level of like, like I know women that are five feet tall. I'm five, eight, uh, five foot, eight inches. I don't know what that is in like, whatever. Uh, we, we, use, oh, we do feet in We use Imperial, right? <laughs> you don't use the metric system, whatever is that. <laughs> Well, we, we do it even worse because we mix the two. So you're never sure which one you're working I, on. Yeah, I don't know. Like, you guys will see these, like, other weights. I'm like, I don't know what that what are stones. I don't know what that means. Like, I have no idea. Um, but, like, I'm not petite, you know, but I know tons of women that are five feet tall. 
And so like, I can't imagine walking around pre-COVID in like a crowded place at night and being like terrified. I've asked women, like if men didn't exist for one day, what would you do? And I've known women who'd say, I would go out at night. Like, think about that. Like, that's something that women just, women tell me casually is like, I don't think like, that's ridiculous to me. But at the same time, I think women should be allowed to go at night, but there's just like, you just have to mitigate risk. Just be smart about it. You know what I mean? Saying like, unfortunately we don't live in a world where people are good all the time. One out of a hundred people is a psychopath. One out of a hundred, which means they have no sense of right or wrong. This is men or women. Yeah. Okay. This is not gender specific. So one out of a hundred, that when you think about those odds, that's why I'm always at a yellow. It's not because I'm like, oh, I think men are evil. It's because I'm naturally, I, I know the statistics. You know what I mean? It's the same reason why I wear a seatbelt every time I get in my car. Because I know the statistics of car crashes. I know the statistics of like helmet laws. It's like these, like these are realities that we we do. Like you know what I mean? It's it's the re- it's that's why I do it. Like, and because my goal is I never want a woman to ever feel scared to say no. That's the big thing. Like that's my ultimate goal when I teach women self defense. It's not even like, oh no, we're gonna plan for these John Wick scenarios where I have to fight like five guys because someone killed my dog. Like what, I, I'm not, we're not planning for that. But like, I would love it just to empower women enough to set clear boundaries and just to say no and be okay with it. And the big thing from what men can do is just be an empathetic to a woman's experience and not gaslight it and say it's not real. Yeah. That, that's the big thing. It's just being good listeners. Be like, tell me about it. You know, that's the only thing that I would say that men could do, but it's, it, it's both sides. Like we talked about, it's, it's nuance. Mm-hmm. It's not one thing to fix everything. Two things can be true simultaneously at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the problem with the, like the narrative at the moment feels really difficult for, for, for us as instructors almost and us as male voice in, voiced instructors. And it's kind of like, well, we shouldn't have to do it. You know, there's the argument that women shouldn't have to do anything at all because, um, because men shouldn't be like that. And I agree, that would be a bit like you were saying, like that would be fantastic. That would be amazing if, yeah. if that could be the society that we lived in and that no one perpetrated violence or even just, it's, I'm, I'm not even sure, I think like you were saying, I'm not even sure it's the violence because you're always going to have violent people. Yes, because you know, yeah, like, you have yeah, people who are naturally unhinged, and like you're just going to have yeah, you're just going to have bad people. Bad people have existed throughout humanity, and I don't, like you say, one in ten, a hundred are psychopaths. So they have a a genuine mental condition that means that they can't experience empathy and like violence. So therefore, you're never going to stop that. But probably, if you could wipe out the little stuff, the standing too close in a tube train, or you know, the creepiness, or the you know that yeah. kind of stuff. But again. That, there's no simple answer, is there? There's no band-aid that just says, here we go, do that, and that will fix it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and that's why I say, like, most uh, violence against women, at least in the States, statistically, is perpetrated by people that they already know. Yeah. So, and that, or family members. Same here, yeah. Yeah, and so I, I imagine it's similar in the UK. Um, and that's the scariest thing, is that, and a lot of women don't want to do crazy, aggressive, violent acts to people they know, because they're so worried about what this is going to do for the rest of their lives to the people around them. Mm. So if we, you empower a woman with leverage-based self-defense like jujitsu, where you can negate kind of the situation by just doing a risk grab escape, by just doing a bear hug defense, well, by just doing... Possible. Yeah, exactly. Just to get out of an uncomfortable situation and set a two arms distance boundary and say no, like just that, like that would be amazing. But like, unfortunately, um, when I do these women's self-defense seminars, and I hate to say it statistically in my habit, and I talk to other female instructors who teach jiu-jitsu as well. Um, if you get a chance, I would highly recommend bringing Kathy Ortiz on. She, she's a female black belt at HQ with Pedro Sauer. Hey, write that down. Yeah. Um, that already there. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and, and she has a really great perspective too most women who come to these seminars are usually women who've already had violent acts done against them mm-hmm. and that's such a sad thing that we have to wait till something terrible happens to do something about but that's not women that's everyone 
Mm. Even like the guys you teach jujitsu. Yeah, quite a lot of and them come from something. Exactly. Whether it's abusive homes, like as a kid, or like they got like something terrible happened. Like a lot of the people I know got jumped, like guys, they got jumped before they did something about it. Mm. Um, and so I wish that as humans, we weren't capable of violence, but we all know because we fight all the time for fun. We are capable of violence. <laughs> And so that's just, I think that to denounce that that's part of human nature, whether you're a man, and I, I don't think that's man or woman specific. I think that's human. That's a human condition that we are capable of violence. And to acknowledge that we are capable of it, does that mean we have to act on that compulsion? You know, and that's what I think training really gives you. It gives you the ability to control that inner, that inner violence that we all have inherently in our system and know how to control it. So training is not to use the violence against people, it's to control it within ourselves. And so my hope is not only just to train women in self-defense, but hope more men train. Because mm. men train, good men who train for the right reasons are, are more importantly gonna be less likely to be perpetrators of aggressive acts towards women, especially if they're training women on the daily basis because they know what it's like for this experience to happen to them. They know what it's like to be in a compromised position in jujitsu. Someone's on top of them, holding them down and they can't get out. Now you know what it feels like to be a woman. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. so it makes you more empathetic to the experience. And I think that's what makes training so great. I think we talked about this with police officers too. It's like, we offer free training at our school to city police officers because we want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Not because, yes, we want to help police officers use non-violent leverage-based techniques so they don't have to go to their primary or secondary weapon and like unload a magazine in a guy, but also so they know what it's like, what if someone puts a knee on my neck mm. and they know what that feels like? Because that just makes us empathetic to the whole experience. And that's the beauty of training. It's not even to defend yourself. It's what it does for you as a person. Like it can make men more empathetic. It can make women more empowered. It humbles the ego driven guy and it raises up a person who has no self-confidence. It's, it's this beautiful thing that we all do that I think sometimes we take for granted because it's so special and we yeah. don't, we don't know what we have sometimes and what it does for people. And so that's why I train. It's not because of the, the techniques that's like a bonus <laughs> and they do have practical implications especially if taught with the right context but it's more about the the philosophy that jujitsu brings to the table is what makes it so special you know i don't well, know that's a very long-winded answer yeah, but no. perfect. <laughs> perfect and i think the other thing is as well what what's better than having a huge group of men that have been empowered to say something if someone else is being weird and creepy to someone else regardless exactly. of men women children there's someone there that's actually confident enough in their self to go hang on a minute that's not cool you need to stop doing that right now yeah you know and and you know you don't have to have white knight syndrome all the time but you know just someone who's confident enough to say no i'm not having that in my presence like you need yeah. to stop now yeah. Male advocates are great for, for women in, in a very particular way. My, um, I will give you a great example that happened to me recently. So in the last month, I, I've had a stalker last month here in great, at Charlottesville in Virginia. I've had a stalker. Um, it's been pretty uncomfortable for me. It's all over social media and I've had to block him on all my social media platforms. He got a hold of my phone number, started calling me and texting me. He actually, he thinks we're married, like all this other stuff. It's like really bad. Um, all the guys at my gym, I had five guys at my gym without me asking, contact him directly to say, stop talking to her. And one of them was my police officer and said, okay, if he talks to you again, we can file a restraining order. I did not ask them to do this. They know I can take care of myself. Like if a physical altercation was to arise, I will be fine. But I don't want to raise, because no one wants to hurt somebody. Like I don't want to have to ever use what I've trained. If I can go through my whole life never harming another human being without consent, which is what a, like a competitive fight is, <laughs> you know, that's consent. <laughs> but, you know, if I can go my whole life with ever hurting another person, that would be ideal. But the fact that I have all these wonderful men that I train with because they respect me and they know that that's not right. You know, I mean, I wish more men were like that just to say, hey, you shouldn't do that. 
they don't have to have white knights and like said like posturing like let's fight for our women but just saying like hey man that's not right and to say that and that's just anything like if you're in a position of power with like other dude bros around you and like dude don't talk about her that way that's our teammate you know i've even seen that in gyms where other guys in the mat are talking about another woman in a gym and say like dude you can't talk about that that's not the that's not what you're supposed to do that's not cool like just that Mm. it's it seems so small but it's not it's not for the women you train with it's not for the women in your life they will appreciate they may never see it they may never even say thank you but it does so much for the culture but you're not doing it for the praise are you you know and that's why i think sometimes people end up a little bit um get it a bit backward they're more about you know virtue signaling and, and sort of looking good rather than actually doing something that makes a difference exactly like just advocating for a woman like and just saying hey man don't don't say that mm. like that's not cool mm. it doesn't even have to be like super aggressive it's just be like that's not cool just like that mm. and these are little things before it escalates into a violent encounter when we're talking about violent encounters there's 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 tons of techniques that you can do to try to address that actual tactical situation and we all know these you know we've trained a long time and it doesn't matter who teaches it but i think understanding the perspective and the more men can understand like that empathetic like to to try to empathize with a woman's experience the better it's going to be it's it's no different than like we have racial issues here in the united states obviously it's a big topic right here and that's something we do here it's like you know how do i have a conversation with somebody who has a different perspective and experience than me and really listening to it it's not my job it's not their job to bring up that topic to me it's my job to bring up that topic to them Be like and, and look stupid and ask the right question you know what i mean like i i used to fight so hard when i was training to to, to get people to listen to me like it's different and guys are like well i'm a small guy it's kind of the same thing i'm like no it's not and to say that to men, like they, they took it personal. I know a lot of guys who took it personal when I said, it's not the same, you know? And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want special treatment. I don't want to be treated differently. I just wanted to acknowledge that's a different experience. That's all I want. I never wanted anything else. I never wanted special treatment. I never wanted them to take it easy on me or else I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> but I do want someone to acknowledge that the experience was different. That's all. Even getting my black belt. There was a joke at my, one of my, my, my training partners say, my friend Dennis, he's like, Kristen, you should get a special stripe on your black belt for all the bullshit you had to deal with when you got your belt. <laughs> um, and so, and that's, that's the big thing for women. And that's why I'm so passionate about this because it's done wonders for me as far as my confidence and understanding that I don't have to accept what society gives me. I can say no. And I can be like, no, that's not right. I don't deserve to be taken that way. And if someone has an issue with it, that's their problem, not mine. I don't have to be liked by all men. I don't have to be liked by all men. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> before we get on to all of the, the, the jujitsu and the, and the practicalities of what people might be able to do to, to help look after themselves, I, I guess, you know, in the UK, it feels like a real moment of like self-reflection for men, you know? Yeah, because the good guys that are out there yeah. they're actually kind of listening to the narrative in the media and that you know they're probably wondering well actually you know about realizing i might have been doing things that could have been causing people to be scared or to be fearful yeah. um so uh, are there any you know, for, you know speaking from a from a female perspective are there any things that men do you know unknowingly that that, that cause angst or that that make you feel unsafe any tips that you can give the guys out there that might be listening just to, you know, back off a bit, space? What, you know, what, 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 yeah. what would you tell the men to do? I, I think that, like, reading body language is a big one. When a woman is, like, closed off like this, that's a sign usually she's very uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean? Even men. Like, when someone's really, like, this, like, internal, like, that's a, that's a sign someone's uncomfortable. And I think reading body language is, is one thing, but also, like, the big thing is like with what, cause I mean, I can only speak from training because I actually, especially with everything going on, um, especially with COVID, it's really hard to tell. Like everyone's like, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's all over <laughs> zoom anyway. Like, so, um, um, but it, it, I think I can't speak for all women. I can only speak for my own personal experience and what I've seen in training. And I know when women who've come to me in training and say, I don't like that guy, he gives me the creeps. 
because I don't, and usually it's because there is a lack of, I hate to use the word consent, but there's a lack of understanding like this is mutual. Here's a great example. Once I was at a bar, um, it's a brewery and the owner came up and he, I got my hair cut and he went out to touch my hair. And I like moved away. I was like, no. And he got upset at me because he thought it was his right to touch my hair without, now he's a, like, I know him, but I, that made me uncomfortable. You know what I mean? So that's like a, that's a good example of like someone who may not intentionally be doing anything that would make someone uncomfortable, but it is, it's, 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 it's breaking a barrier of physical space. That's not, you know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I, I hate to say that, but like, I mean, and I'm, there's, cause I, I don't think all men are evil. I don't, I work, I train with some of the best men I've ever met in my entire life. I wish more men were like the guys I train with, you know, I, I, I have a lot of faith in, in men after training jujitsu versus before, but like, that's just an example of like, you, did he have malice intentions? No, he just liked my haircut and he wanted to touch it, but that made me uncomfortable. No, then he got angry at me for not letting him touch my hair. Like somehow my body was a right to him. And these are just personal experiences. So that's like an example of something that's not intentionally, you know, uncomfortable, but like, you know, that's not yours. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like you, it's like you say like, like, it's like, I have $5 and you're like, oh, that's my $5 now. No, like if I loaned you $5 last time, it doesn't mean I owe you this time. Like, it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't do that with like money. (laughs) You know, it's, 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 it's kind of like that. It's so I can't tell you specifically. I can only speak from my own personal experience. I'm sure a lot of your female students would probably have a really interesting perspective from their own. Um, I'm really lucky in that I grew up in a very empowered household. And I also grew up in on the mats at a very young age with Mm -hmm. a lot of really great guys. So they've always given me like a platform to, to be empowered and to give me the opportunity to shine and succeed. Uh, Master Sour being the biggest one, of course. So I can't speak to my own personal experience, but that's something that like, as men, you could just ask women in your life. You know what I mean? Hey, is there ever been a situation where you were uncomfortable, but you were scared to say something? Yeah. I I mean, Again, just listening to you talk, like the, the images are flashing through my mind. And, and I don't train jujitsu to, to compete or to, you know, to, for any any of those reasons. It's just, I just love the art. I love the guys that I train with. Yeah, of course. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's just a fantastic, um, yeah, fantastic pastime. Um, but I, I often think that the one place that I might end up being called to use it is in situations where you can't easily manage the distance and, and, and those sorts of things. So it's, it's always, and it's not for me, it would always be that white knight stepping into a situation on, for example, public transport. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the amount of times that I've been in a situation, where I just think, oh my God, you know, what's going to happen here? And you know, what am I going to have to do to stop something bad from happening? And consent, you're right, is so important. But when people are just like you know, squashing into this tiny little space. There's yeah. no such thing as consent. I know, like, there's no like personal bubble, but maybe people will have that now because of COVID. <laughs> It'd be like the one positive thing that's come out of this. Yeah, you're right, maybe. <laughs> yeah. The best, like, the best way of establishing distance now is just going to be coughing loudly, and then I everyone's know. Because gonna... I mean, like, you know, like when you form a queue and you're like, I don't know how far to stand behind this person. Now there's dots on the ground. Everyone will be fine. <laughs> like everyone will know. Like it will be. It will actually be easier. Um, yeah. yeah I, sorry, I had to break up the seriousness of this. With yeah. Some no, for sure. It's been, it's been super heavy because last time we just tell cracking jokes the whole time. This was like super <laughs> serious. Yeah, yeah, we, but, we thought, we, yeah, we thought we switched the tone. <laughs> I know, oh, right? Oh, we just like, oh, this is yeah. a full 180 mm-hmm. from last time. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, Dave. Um, no, no, Dave, no. Dave, <laughs> see how you got it? Um, Dave said um, something interesting. The hug tonight, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> the first time um, he was on, Dave Porter, and he was saying that he wants to give, if I remember, I don't want to misquote him, but he was basically saying he wanted to make sure that all the women in his school had the ability that if they wanted to, they didn't feel bad about saying to a guy, I don't want to roll with you. Yeah, 
but that should be everybody. Yeah, it right. That was part of the conversation, actually, wasn't it, Pete? Yeah. Like, I think it yeah. did go then to the point of it's not just women to men, women to men, it's anyone to anyone. Yeah. 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 But like, you should be able to say no. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, you should be able to say no. I've, I've done it. I've done it in like a very like subtle way. Um, that's only happened to me once, really, where I was like, hmm, where I knew this guy was like gunning for me and he wanted to hurt me because I tapped him. And so like he was like, I knew he was like, going to be vindictive. It, it's a subtle thing, training as a woman with men, unless they you've already kind of earned their respect. Because unfortunately, jujitsu, you earn your respect through physical domination of another human being. And so when I tell people that I do this for a living, they're like, how did you do it? I'm like, um, <laughs> you know, I'm like, it, it, cause it sucked so hard for me in the beginning. Uh, yeah. And so I don't want women to have to go through that. Like I would not wish my personal experience to get where I am on anyone because it's not for everybody. Mm. Like what happened to me to get to this point, how tough the training was. And so what Porter is saying is absolutely correct. Women shouldn't have to go through the hardships that I went through to get the same results. You know what I mean? To learn the same jujitsu. So if they don't want to, like I trained with everybody because I'm a knucklehead and, you know, but like a lot of people made me very uncomfortable and I would love it if every woman or every person was like, no man, not today. And we're okay with saying it and people wouldn't take it personally, but that also comes from the culture. Um, we are very lucky at my gym and I didn't realize what this would do and I didn't plan it this way. It just kind of happened. So I got hired by my three co-owners of our gym, uh, Brent, Adam, and Sean, my three other guys that own the gym with me. They hired me to teach at their gym, not because I'm a woman, because I'm apparently very good at what I do because I'm a good teacher. I'm the head instructor at this gym. We have five black belts. I'm the head instructor. And the head instructor, the head coach for men, women, and kids is me. That speaks volumes to the way the men at the gym treat women in general. So we, so all the men at our gym treat women with a certain level of respect because the head coach is a woman. So when the guys at my gym train with women, they train with women based on their size, not their gender, which is what we've talked about before. Because, so it doesn't just change the way like women are empowered, but it changes the way men treat women. And that's the big thing is I want to give more women in jujitsu and martial arts community a voice, not because I don't want to stick them in the women's only self-defense group or the only teaching kids. Put a woman in a co-ed teaching environment and put her in a leadership role of an adult class. Don't just put her in like, oh, she teaches other women or she teaches kids. It's the same jujitsu. Put let her teach the adults. Let her teach a co-ed class. And Listen, was, was the was the gym there um, before you started teaching, or did you you start that gym together? Um, I started teaching here in August. So was it already there before? Yes, it was here before. It was here before. It was run by three black belts. Um, And they're all very good. They're all very good black belts. Like one of them is a former Pan Am champion. Um, Like they're all very tough. They're great guys. They're great businessmen. So this is actually their side hustle. This is their side business because they're very successful businessmen. And they had a lot of really tough guys, but they didn't have a ton of women. (laughs) But putting you in charge... Was there a culture change or was that culture already there? They already had a very laid back culture, but according to my coworkers and my co-owners, they said that there's been a culture shift. There's definitely way more women since I've been here and, and been in a, in a leadership role. Um, mm-hmm. It's made a huge difference. Like, like um, the kids class before I got there was almost all boys. The kids class is 50, 50 girls and boys now in the kids class it's 50 percent each which is what it should be there are more women in the in the adult jiu-jitsu class now than there was before and i do a once a month free women's only class not because i think women should train separately from men because i want to cultivate a culture of empowerment amongst women to empower each other and encourage women because sometimes uh, women can be very competitive with each other at least when i started training jiu-jitsu it was very competitive with other women and so I want to cultivate a culture of we are on all in this together and we're all here to, to help each other and get better. And so it's not so much like, and it's also to help new women for their first class meet all these other women like, hey, it doesn't matter if you're a beginner. 
we're not going to judge you because we all started there yeah. you know and trying to help so we, we just do that once a month and it's completely free and it really helps to just get all the women like I had tw- I had like a you know it, it just and I and I do it for girls and women so I have like the youngest girl in class and the oldest and it, it's really amazing because it just kind of empowers these women to help each other I think one of the most important things for women's self-defense is that the women's class is taught by a woman I, I know I've been argued this with guys all the time well I mean it's the same jujitsu I'm like yes but the women won't believe you that it works the women will not believe you unless they see a woman do it. And it's a woman that's smaller than the person that moves being done to. You know what I mean? Makes they, perfect like, sense. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. you got to believe it. Yeah. Like, what does Master Sarah say all the time? Let's see if it's true. <laughs> like, this is all the time. Like, because it, it's, it's true. Like, so I, I, I don't, I mean, it, it, like I said, this is all a very nuanced issue. And I'm very passionate about my perspective of doing this. Because it, it will be 15 years I've been doing jujitsu this February was 15 years and and that's just jujitsu um and I just been thinking about this a lot because I am blown away by the amount of respect and reverence I am given at my at where I work because I came in a black belt not a white belt who worked their way up but came in as a black belt and I don't know if Adam, Sean, and Brent meant to do this, but they talked me up for months before I got hired, before I was there. They talked me up. They're like, no, you don't understand. Like, Kristen's super technical. She's like the best with kids, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, they talked me up for like a while. And I don't know if they did that on purpose or if they were just trying to like smooth it over before they hired me with the students. But the amount of respect I've been derived from my, like, it's amazing. Like I, my students are incredible. I love them all so much. My kids my men, my women, they're, they're incredible. Like it's, it's really amazing. And I don't know if I meant to do it, but, but I don't know if they meant to do it. Like, I don't think they hired me because I'm a woman. I think they hired me just because I happen to be really good at teaching kids, but it's been really amazing for like the culture of the gym. Like it's, it's really incredible. And I think the more times like as a, as men who own jujitsu clubs or schools, put women and power women into leadership roles or use women as demo partners like you're teaching the technique but you make the woman demo it Mm. like little things like that like this is something my friend jim kelly does which i highly recommend if you're going to get someone on a podcast you should get jim too but um what jim does is like he would use a woman to demonstrate how to do like hicks and moves not him because he's a big guy he would use like a smaller woman and be like and she would do the same move it just, you know what I mean? It like proves the point better, but it also empowers the women. So people see that jujitsu is not gender specific and that's not, it's leverage based. And these little things can apply to everyday life. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that's, that's what work, what this is about. Like, cause we all know that this like jujitsu and training is a vehicle or like almost like um, a metaphor for life, mm. you know? And so once we like learn these things on the mat, it's easier to translate these to everyday life. Um, but if, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> so thank you. I'm all, again with my long-winded answers. I mean, uh, yeah, just, I, I am conscious of that as well when we're teaching that, you know, I'm, I'm six foot four and Robin's, you know, all of five, four. <laughs> 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 um, the width of my head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> By four this way. Yeah. yeah. Right, actually, um, this way it's long head. Not like that one. <laughs> it's actually it's a sideways. It's like, I've almost got like a second set of jaws that comes out. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's like an alien, you know. Yeah. It's, like, it's like an alien. <laughs> I am conscious. I am always conscious. To be fair, that I think I do sometimes think. Yeah, are, there, are people going to believe that this works? Like. You know, until they, like you say, they go away and try it. And like my sow says, you know, let's see if it works. And you go off and, yeah. But I, yeah, I am conscious of that. And and we you do sometimes get the little th- the little the questions from people like smaller that are going to say, well, is this going to work for me though? You know. So I think I can't think of anything better than, you know, having a, a female instructor or you know, do you always want to learn from the biggest guy in the room? Probably, probably not. 
not unless you are a big guy yeah you know what i'm saying like people want to learn from people who are similar body types to them because that they're, they're going to have a nuance to the move or like a little trick to make it work for your body why do you think i learned from master sour because like he is not the biggest guy in the room not yeah. even compared to the gracies yeah you no know, he's not and he'll be the first one to say that he's not hickson mm-hmm. you know not saying i don't want yeah. love hickson i love learning from master hickson he's amazing but i love learning from master sour because he's got these little details for the smaller person that work really well so that's why his game works well for me and i always clarify this to these guys i teach a guy who's ukrainian at my gym who's been doing sambo since he was 10 he's 49 <laughs> oh god <laughs> oh yeah it's awful it's terrible it's just like he's like and then and then here i break your leg i, I would just break it i was like okay so he just does stuff that i can't do because he's so big and strong and i'm like and i tried to explain to him like i understand what you're saying that you would just do that but you have to understand i can't and i think he started to get it after the last couple of times we rolled and I was very like slippery and like kind of moving around. He's like, I can't hold you down. I'm like, I know. Cause if, if you could, I would die. <laughs> <laughs> you would kill me. Um, so it's like one of those things where it's like, I think having, I think there's nothing wrong with learning from the biggest guy in the room. If the biggest guy in the room is very technical and you are also a big guy, cause you're going to, you know, I'm pretty flexible and mobile. There's a lot of guys at my gym who can't do my moves because they're not, they don't have the mobility to do what I do. You know what I mean? So they're not going to want to learn from me. So that's why I think having a variety of styles and strength, like a lot of you guys do the JKD stuff. You guys do like, yeah, exactly. So you guys, you get it. Absorb what is useful, reject what is useless and add what is uniquely your own. You know? And that's why it's so important to learn from a lot of different people. You know? Because then you just, you get so many different ways to do things. Even if you don't use it. Yeah still good to see it's like master sales is about the buffet right you, you take yeah. the bit that works for you exactly i mean and so yeah i think but i just say that like just as men empowering women to show that it's not just that this is not gender specific that's mm. the big thing it's like when it's not gender specific and you just treat jujitsu as jujitsu then it's 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 so much more transformative and it, it, it reaches a lot of different people then you know, like I, I would love jujitsu to, or martial arts in general, to reach spaces where it's not traditionally seen. You know, like that would be amazing. You know, I mean, it, 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 our, our goal, at least my goal, is to make this as accessible to people as possible by not by making it cheaper or not, but like things like that, but making it appear more accessible. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like appear more accessible. Like anyone can do this. That's why I love teaching kids. Like, how can I get an intelligent eight-year-old to do a proper scissor sweep? You know what I mean? Like, that's pretty cool. It's like, oh, it's like real. It like, it like works. You know, I love that. That's why I love teaching kids, you know, because it's like, yeah. oh, this actually works. We, 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 put ourselves, we put ourselves with the ultimate challenge last week. And as uh, your specialty with kids, we tried, I tried to teach the, uh, I tried to teach the, uh, guillotine escape from guard over Zoom. <laughs> how how incredibly ambitious of you. Very. Shall I tell you what made it even better? I tried to teach it where all I've got at my disposal is a dummy. <laughs> Why? I don't know. It just seemed like a good thing to do at the time. I know. I hope you did made them do so many shoulder stands. Just <laughs> shoulder stands, like as a solo drill for like 30 minutes. Before you even tried to like do everything else. To be fair, they did okay. I know it wasn't it wasn't our greatest moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's tough. It, it, was, fun. it was fun. <laughs> it, it was when he threw it over to me, Christine, and my little boy had never done it before. And uh, and the only way that we could demo it was me doing it to him. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Oh my goodness. Uh, it's, that's, it's good fun. It's good fun. Well, you know, if you ever want, I would be more than happy to teach a Zoom class for you guys. Oh my God. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's Zoom. Like, I, I can teach it anytime. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I, I, we're not, we're not, I mean, I've taught a Zoom class to um, people who have reached out to me from like all over the country. That's like the one advantage of COVID is that I think we're more taking, not taking for granted the interconnectedness of this community. 
mm-hmm. and understanding that we're kind of all in this together with with COVID-19 and like businesses and gyms and, and stuff mm-hmm. like that and understanding that we're all in this together to kind of make sure that this thing that's so special jujitsu contact sports contact martial arts does not die because it, it's be, uh, there'd yeah. be lots of excited kids if they knew that they were going to be being taught by you oh thank you well i would we'd, uh, we'd, we'd give it the big build up like they did before you arrived as well we'd, we'd say she's so great you're so technical <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then they'd be super disappointed when i make them all do solo drills they'll be like what's going on i'm like just <laughs> unless you have a partner you don't want to do jujitsu with like yeah because i have some youtube live classes that i taught so i can't see the kids do anything and i did them all as solo drills or with like this very ostentatious like teddy bear i'll show it to you so this is my 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 dummy (laughs) um his name is bear drills um uh I, I gave him a gi and a purple belt because I feel like he's a purple belt. And I, I would just do moves on him because I didn't have like a dummy dummy. So like it's, 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 yeah. That's what I did during, <laughs> I was in lockdown. I was like, well, I guess I'm going to teach on this because uh, I didn't know what else to do. So was, was he Bear Drills before you had to demo on him? Or was it, did, is, oh, no, did no. It- I gave him that name because I thought it was funny. I like puns. <laughs> Um, but, but I, I, I like puns and cringeworthy humor, hence this, um, but, <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's, yeah. So that's what I did over COVID and I, like uh, the lockdown and it was, it, it was good for me because I, I think collectively like jujitsu had a consciousness shift where we decided no more traditional warmups. Like, I think we all like, oh, like in the live classes I've been back to, no one runs anymore. They're like, no, we're just going to do solo drills and partner drills. Like we're not going to do any more <laughs> running calisthenics, line drills, old warmups are out. We've decided like no one wants to do it. It's just straight to contact. Like everyone's like, like it, it was like a collective jujitsu consciousness shift that everyone was like, no, it's so <laughs> awful. I, I've been running during this whole lockdown. I never want to run again. <laughs> It. yeah it's the only thing they've been able to do so no one wants to see it ever again exactly so i think now everyone's like can we just like drill like can we like against a person like in the states like there's are certain states that can have contact and cannot like you know and so here in the states it's so state to state so there's certain places like california and new york which are super locked down and then there's other places where it's like ibjjf is having tournaments mm. So like we, there was a tournament that was approved in Virginia and I was shocked that it was allowed. So like you had to wear a mask if you were watching, but if you were competing, you didn't have to wear one and people were doing jujitsu. And so, which is fine, but I was just like, I'm like, huh. I was like very like, and they got it approved from the state department, from the health department in the state of Virginia. And so we're like, okay, I guess this is what we're doing, you know? And so I think people just, were just so happy to compete again, you know what I mean? And just do jujitsu that everyone didn't care like i didn't even care if my students won or lost i was like we're at a tournament this is amazing yeah i think i think that dragged me out of retirement if someone said you can compete but that's the only way you can do jujitsu i'm there i'm i'm I'm... tomorrow like yeah yeah yeah, i mean it's tough right now for everyone that's why i admire you guys like like here in in united states it's a little easier because it's state to state like ibjjf is only doing tournaments in states that it's allowed to like texas florida new orleans like in louisiana things like that like but new york and california where they normally do their tournaments they're not happening this year so it's it's been tough for for everybody but i know we've gotten a little sidetracked off of the original topic yeah. but i hope you don't mind yeah, no, no, it's, cool. no, it's, it's good to have oh, a, good. good to have an interlude uh go on billy yeah. i think you were gonna read yeah out. no i was gonna say is a question that's just come in online for you Kristen. um loving listening to you talk can relate so much to what you were saying earlier about feeling safe, but what, what are your top tips for women to feel safe in a practical sense and to also give off an air of confidence? Okay. Yeah. So first one, um, <clears throat> posture. I know that sounds like so simple. We talk about it in jujitsu, but posture sitting up. <coughs> I apologize. Uh, we have uh, allergies right now for me. So posture, 
walking around with an air of confidence is posture is a big one. Two, two arms distance. I always try to establish two arms distance uh, all the time you know, to m- mitigate uh, personal space because that's going to stop someone from grabbing me. That's going to stop someone from hitting me. So if I mitigate at least two arms distance from myself and the opponent, they cannot hit me, kick me, grab me, etc. So if I feel uncomfortable in any situation, I'm immediately creating two arms distance with my hands up in a defensive posture. This is like, hey, man, I don't want any trouble, even if it's like reaching two arms away from me. So posture is just to walk around with an air of confidence. Two. Three, saying no and saying it loudly, but I always say, no, thank you. That's what I always do. So it always sounds polite. So if someone's like, hey, I need your help by my car. I'm like, I put my two arms distance, put my arm out, be like, no, thank you. And just be really loud about it. (laughs) Be really loud and obnoxious about it. Just to establish that, no, I do not want to come over there and help. And if they come forward towards me, then I know what their intentions are. So I've already escalated from a yellow to an orange to a red. Um, And then, so those are like the big ones right there. Um, Another one that I always do is uh, check your six. I'm constantly aware of my surroundings and I'm constantly in a position to protect myself at all times. So I'm always checking my six being like, okay, what's behind me? Always know where my keys are. I don't want to be in a position where I have to fuddle around in a bag to get my keys to get into my car or anything like that. Um, so I'm always constantly being aware of my surroundings and protecting myself at all times. So am I in a position to make base, not letting someone push me or pull me? Am I in a position to maintain that two arms distance? Is my back easily exposed? Am I near objects? Like, could I be pushed against a wall, the floor, a car? These are just little things, like just understanding your surroundings and kind of where you are in a practical sense. Um, other things is that I always tell women, the big one is trust that feeling in your gut and it's okay to, to trust it, Mm. you know? Cause I think a lot of women are afraid, like, I don't want to come off as like, you know, a certain way. Mm. I'm like, maybe you should trust that. That's, that's your, that's your intuition and your fear telling you you're not safe. It's a spider sense. (laughs) It really is though. But like, there's, there's a feeling that I think all of us get, not just women, but all of us get when we're like, oh, we're not safe here. Mm. It's like an evolutionary yeah, it's how we <laughs> yeah, like, but I think the biggest thing for women is walking with a sense of posture and walking and, and establishing that no thank you and that two arms distance right mm. away puts you in a position to implement all these other really practical self-defense perspectives. Like being aware of your surroundings, checking your six. Like, and like, like I said, the moment I leave my apartment, I'm out of yellow. Mm. Like, I, I mean, if someone looks suspicious, that is always in the corner of my eye. Mm. You know, just because like, I don't know. Why don't I have a hundred people psychopath? Like, I don't know. And also like, you know, I even do this when I teach kids. Like if I see someone come into the gym and I'm like, no, nah, that doesn't look, you know, like, here's a great example. So like we, we've had, um, I had a homeless guy come into our gym. The first thing I did when I came to gym is walk back behind the desk so I have the, he, so he's staying on the other side of the desk and he's at least like at least a good six feet away from me. Not because of COVID, because I, he means he has to get over the desk, a glass desk to get to me mm-hmm. before I ask him to leave nicely. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to stand right next to him because I don't know what he's capable of. I don't know if he's armed. Now, mm-hmm. is that presumptuous of me? Is that rude of me? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't care. Yeah because it's my right to protect myself. Now I'm not offensively going to attack that person, but I'm just gonna take some preventative measures just in case an altercation is to arise. So I put myself in the best position possible to make a hasty escape or to defend myself with, a, with, you, know, with you know, using, and then make a hasty escape. Yeah. You know, I don't need to beat someone up. I don't need to hurt somebody to be effective at self-defense. You know, preventative measure is 90% of this. Yeah. de-escalation you know so all the guy wanted was socks so i gave him some socks that i lost and found and then he left so it was completely harmless i help him out he's thankful he has socks now he can sleep outside with warm feet you know and like everything was fine but mm-hmm. i just took some preventative measures to make sure that all like my eyes and t my eyes and t's were crossed and dotted you know what i mean yes yeah, so that, that's not a healthy level of skepticism isn't it Yes. It's a healthy level. It doesn't have to be rude. It doesn't have to be like, 
aggressive. It just and has not to paranoid be. either. What? And not paranoid either. No, it's not mm-hmm. paranoid. It's just like a healthy amount of like, oh, this person is kind of giving me the, you know, and we turns out like the guy was just a homeless guy that was sleeping around the gym anyway, you know, and he kind of walks throughout Charlottesville. Like it is what it is. I, he probably is not even dangerous, but it's just like, you don't know, mm-hmm. you know, because you don't know if he's on drugs you know what I mean or like what someone's capable of so these are kind of like these practical little things that's I like to use examples just to kind of show how I take the principles that I kind of live by and how I apply them in my daily life Mm. you know because like I'm a woman who trains and I train a lot but I don't have this big of a chip on my shoulder as to run away my ego is not that big I'm totally okay with running away and living to run away another day that's just me Makes sense. There was there was another question, but I think you've answered the majority of it because it was asking about what concepts, and you've obviously spoken about managing the distance and, and those sorts of things. But they, they go on to say, you know, what, what would be your number one technique that you would go to to convince somebody to come to jujitsu that demonstrates how they can feel safe? Yeah. Base. The concept of base. It's the most empowering thing I've ever taught. Um, the first thing I teach in a women's self-defense seminar is base. So hips moving in the direction of force. So if someone wants to push me back, my hips have to move in that direction back. And it's so powerful when a woman feels that I can't push you or I can't pull you somewhere. Just the concept of base. We take it for granted because we train on the ground. We do all the fun stuff, you know, but we use this concept all the time, right? But we take it for granted because like, oh, everyone just knows how to do this intuitively. They don't. I've worked with high level female power lifters who do not know how to organize their body to use base properly. And they are stronger than me because they don't know how to do it. You know what I mean? So to make someone a believer in a practical sense, if I show someone like a guard pass or, you know what I mean? Or a submission that doesn't make them believe in jujitsu because they don't see the practical application of it. But if I show you stand up and I'm going to teach you how to not let someone push you or pull you and how to regain your base. And then maybe teach you like a wrist grab escape you're instantly going to believe in it. You're like, oh, I can see this. I can teach this to my kids to make sure my kid doesn't get taken away. So like, that's what, that's like what I give people for instant gratification that or learning how to stand in base from the ground to get back up to your feet, adding on to that piggybacking off of it. Those are the things I teach right away when I teach a women's self-defense seminar or just a self-defense seminar for kids because it proves jujitsu works. Because if I teach, not saying that the guard passes and all the other stuff, the glamorous, you know, kind of. That, that, needs, that needs more context, doesn't it? The guard yes. passes. Context. What's guard? Why would yeah. I pass it? <laughs> no, but if I teach you base and a wrist grab escape or like standing up in base, then you're like, oh, this makes sense. And this illustrates the concepts in jujitsu, which is how do we organize our body in a way that makes us, puts us in the strongest position possible and our opponent in the weakest. That's jujitsu. It's beautiful. Like that, it, one person's comfortable, the other person's uncomfortable. Both people are comfortable. It's not jujitsu. So it's not working. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. It's, might as well, it might as well just be two people hugging in pajamas. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong. We support everyone's right to hug in pajamas. Um, <laughs> okay. But that's what I would teach. That's like the first thing I always teach, uh, even in a kid's class. You know, and I think it's one of those moves that like I think a lot of men might take for granted if they're big and strong. Like if you're a big, strong, athletic man, you're like, who's going to grab my wrist? Well, maybe no one will grab your wrist, but someone's going to grab your kid's wrist. Someone's yeah. going to grab your wife's wrist, you know what I mean? And take your leg, you know what I mean? And then, then they're like, oh, that makes sense. I'm like, exactly. So that, that's, that's the first thing I try to teach women to make them like, hey, this works. And it's tested. It's tested. That, above all things, like I know that works. Like some of these flashier moves that you do on the ground, you know, they may not always work all the time. Like, mm, I'm going to do this crazy sweep that I saw on a video. Um, but I know base works. Yeah, yeah no, it's good. I, I always think about like wrist grabs and those sorts of things because it's that, you know, it could be something that like just changes somebody's mind really quickly. But, but base is exactly the same because if you go to, you know, pull somebody and they don't move, that's like, well, this is a fight not worth this having. This is my move on to the next, you know, zebra or whatever it is, going back to my National Geographic analogy of earlier. Yeah, because well, now you've just made yourself a hard target by just yeah. being, having base, yeah. by just by doing the simplest thing. It just makes you more difficult to deal with. And, it, and it's so simple, but I think we all take it for granted the longer we train. 
because mm. we do it intuitively. You forget, you forget the learning phase almost. You yeah, because yeah, exactly. And that's what I always advise for high level black belt instructors: never assume knowledge. Mm. Like, never forget what it was like to be a white belt. The moment you forget what it's like to be a white belt, I think you're doing a, a disservice. Mm to your students because now you're not helping them you know what I mean because you're assuming knowledge and you're going to assume that you've always been able to do this but you, there was a time you didn't remember mm. and that's one thing that I'm really passionate about I think that's what I why I think I like teaching kids so much because it forces me to never forget because <laughs> you know I have kids who don't know the difference to their right and their left so yeah. I, I have adults that don't actually either so we have adults that don't know that yeah, I was going to say <laughs> I think there's something you you mentioned earlier no, Kristen, that we, we, we also um, experience is, you know, you said about setting boundaries, you say stop or no thank you, or whichever, whatever kind of simple direct message that you use. I'm not sure if it's the same for you, but it, it might well be, is that that seems to be the bit that people like to do the least. They feel a bit embarrassed by doing it. Um, and I think you touched on it earlier as well. And you said it, it's nicer to be, or it's better to be respected than liked. But have you got any kind of... Um, words of wisdom on getting into that kind of performance anxiety of of saying you know outright no or stop um i think this is a bigger issue than we like to it's 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 combination of personal yeah and cultural yeah <laughs> so i think culturally for women women if you talk about if you um i don't know if you guys are familiar with the work of Brene brown but she's a sorry guys <coughs> <coughs> these allergies are killing my ass <coughs> <coughs> I might need water. One second. Okay. But, um, <laughs> I'm going to need water, guys. I apologize. You guys talk about yourselves. <laughs> I think she's yeah. allergic to bears. Yeah, I reckon. It's, it's yeah. a bear came into town. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, so, but what they were saying is that the cultural standards for women are inherently to not rock the boat. So that's a cultural thing. Yeah. And it's taught not by just mo like it's, 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 and just like there are standards for men too, mm -hmm. like not showing emotion, not showing vulnerability or, you know what I mean? Like certain mm -hmm. things like for men that also exist. I'm not saying these don't just exist for women. And so these cultural standards of not rocking the boat are really ingrained in the culture. I, I think this is, I, I will say Western culture. I cannot speak to, Eastern culture or anything like that. I can only speak to Western culture. Mm. So that's one, but two, it's personal. And the way we overcome this, I think is through confidence. And the confidence the assertion is that for me at least, is that the confidence to know that I don't need external validation to, mm. to validate my existence. Yes. I don't need the external validation of men to know that I am worthy of taking up a certain amount of space mm. or people in general. Yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's hard. That's more of an internal thing. And I think that's why it makes training martial arts so valuable is that we use that as its own kind of like, I don't know if this is for you, but jujitsu for me has been like better than a therapist. You know what I mean? Because it, it just, it, it forces you to, really address your demons address your ego address your confidence or lack thereof mm. for me and being like okay you're you're valid there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with you saying no and i tell women that every time i do a seminar i'm like mm. there is nothing wrong with you saying no and when i teach them some martial art like just a little bit of self-defense with it then they don't have the fear of the repercussions of saying no yeah. like the physical repercussions yeah. maybe they'll still be afraid of like the verbal or like the cultural repercussions of saying no especially if it's someone they know i think they'll have more of an issue if it's someone you know and that's why a lot of women will go along in situations that they don't want to be a part of just because they have this they just like it's just easier to go along with it to 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 say no and to fight it off mm. and, and you hear that that's so sad isn't it mm. yeah, it is very sad I was going to say, you know, with the children's classes, we actually get them obviously to practice, you know, the saying no and, the, you know, setting the boundaries. And, you know, at the beginning, they're all fidgety and grabbing their belts and, you know, nothing's believable. But, but you know, 
couple of months in, they they are believable. But do you do that with the adults at all, Christine? Um, I don't do it in my fundamental class, but I do it in women's self defense seminars mm. because women feel a little silly doing it in front of men. But if they do it with each other, they feel a little more empowered and be like, "No, you can do it!" Like it's much more positive. It's just like the the energy in the room is a little different because I think a lot of women um, have this fear of looking stupid in front of men mm. because there is a little bit of like, at least when I was coming up in the ranks, you couldn't be just good. You had to be better. You know, you couldn't just be like, if, like there'd be times when I wouldn't even get to roll because no one would roll with me when I was a white belt because they thought, well, what am I going to get out of this? You know? The jokes on them i'm a black belt they're not here anymore uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not about who's best it's about who's left um <laughs> so that's the, that's the see so i mean i i think it's great to practice you know for people especially women but i think in the all women environment especially just to work on like establishing clear boundaries and they do i think like i think um the gracies do a great job of it and they're what eve torres has done with the women's empowered program has been really amazing and revamping it because I remember what it was before Eve took it over and what she's done with it now, like the updated version is so much better. I think because you have a female voice speaking about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not saying that Henry and Huron don't know what they're talking about. They do. But I think Eve makes women feel more comfortable to like do those drills where you practice saying no, as soon as someone gets close to you, you know what I mean? I guess it's not just the message, it's the messenger as well, isn't it? Well, yeah, and I hate to say that it's true, but it's just because women just want to feel, when you make people feel comfortable in uncomfortable positions, they're going to thrive in those situations then. Mm. And that's our goal in jiu-jitsu is like, right? Like we want to like, okay, sometimes you don't want to escape. Sometimes you just want to survive. You're like, oh, I'm mounted. Maybe I just want to chill and just hang out a little bit, you know? That's and that's what we game. do. What? That's Bill's whole game. <laughs> we'll chill. And sit there until you get bored. <laughs> and then then you dismount and you're like and then he gets out yeah. <laughs> is that pretty accurate <laughs> there's Completely. some truth to that there's some truth to that though but that's what we were trying to do in jiu-jitsu is teach people to be comfortable in uncomfortable positions master salaries talks about what does this do for your social life right so what if we could do that and have the confidence but with like um what i call it is calm assertive calm assertive energy which master sour is the master of calm assertive energy to be like no I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to accept being treated that way. Clear expectations, clear cut boundaries, not aggressive, just boundaries. Some people may not like that, but that's okay. Yeah. And I have to be secure with that as a person, man or a woman or child, doesn't matter, with having that calm assertive energy and be like, no, I will not accept this. You know, that's all this is. That's what all of the jujitsu is for. It's just to become the person you're supposed to be. There's definitely power in in that um, you know in that role play. You know the, the one time that in real life that I got close to almost using jujitsu again, it was in that public transport situation. But I can remember um, having practice like a power push, you know, just like a, a just a mind changing kind of technique with Alan Manganello when he was in the UK once, and we did it at a seminar. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was like I was in that seminar again. The guy was, you know, causing trouble. And, and it was a very quick, just a you know, little power push, changed his mind, warned him that it was going to end very badly for him if he carried on. But it was just that, that one instant, you know, no need for any trouble, kind of exactly. be on your way, just keep going, you know. Exactly. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to do that. I would, I would had I not practiced that with, with, Alan, um, I don't know, a few months before, you can almost guarantee that, that situation would have escalated like instantly, straight, you know, off the off the scale. Yeah. Well, because I think, oh, go on. No, yeah. sorry, go on. no, no, I was just gonna say, like, well, I love that. I love that really accepting like these preventative, like I have drills that I do for my students. I do mirror and shadowing drills all the time to maintain two arms distance length and to mm -hmm. like watch for level changes and like like, and I do combat circles in kids' classes, like what the Valente brothers do, like where it's like, okay, I'm gonna come up behind you. What do you do? Like, you know, cause we, we, we do the self-defense moves from Gracie Jiu Jitsu, but yeah. do we really know them? Cause we don't spar them. You see what I'm saying? 
you know, do we spar that? Like you, like you said, you probably would not have done that unless you had done it a drill simulating that stress mm-hmm. under pressure. That's why the jujitsu on the ground works so well. It's not because the techniques are so great. It's because of the training methodology. Okay, here's a couple of moves. Now go spar it. If you don't spar it or you don't put a little bit of resistance in there, then it's just theory. Something Pete said earlier about, you know, being a bigger guy teaching a class, do people believe it? Um, made me think, you know, is this when, when you start out in jiu-jitsu, there's so many opportunities for people to shut down what you do or what you're trying. And as every single class is an opportunity to lose faith in the process and, and, and give up. Um, but it does work, people. <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> and I think putting, you know, for me as well, what, what really kind of made it all kind of sink in is, is when you started messing around with like with gloves on, because when somebody's like actually trying to punch you, jujitsu is like cheating. <laughs> it's no. like so much easier. <laughs> it's like, you know, when, when they're not just trying to squash you or hold a position or do jujitsu back to you, when they're trying to punch you, it's it's just it's too easy. It's like but again, you know, you don't want people to be scared by, you know, putting gloves on, you know, their first, their second, their third class or, you know. So it's, it's, that, it's that time in between, you know, building their confidence that it, that it does work. And yeah. What I was going to say was I was, I was a mate, like, I remember, I still, obviously it was a while ago now, but I still remember that first experience of, again, a, of self-defence, you know, of seminars where it was really focusing on the self-defence stuff. And... It, having come from a striking, all right, I've done judo, but coming from a striking background, I still had that feeling of, oh, that seems a bit excessive if someone's just pushed me, you know. Exactly. But it's exactly back to what you were saying about the the violence, the you know, the differentiation between, yeah. you know, you know, I was used to violence. I was used to punching people in the face and kicking people and doing judo and throwing people on the floor, and but then the the reality of oh if someone you know push single hand push okay i was like oh yeah but that could break their wrist and i'm like it took me a while to get my head around the idea that yeah yeah but they've got no right to lay hands on you in the first place exactly and yeah. i remember that being like one of the overwhelming um and it was actually a hoist it was actually a hoist seminar bizarrely um with with one particular move and i was like oh i don't know that seems a bit ex-. and then i was like actually no someone's just laid hands on you like that's different mm-hmm. violence to the violence you're used to of someone punching you in the face. Your response to that is, you know, what's your normal response? With all? You know. Yeah. But it's yeah. yeah, it's I don't know. Yeah, it was really weird. And and hey, what move was it? Um, it was chest the, push defense. Yeah, single handed chest push. Yeah, with the yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. He was doing it to me, by the way. Yeah, I was doing it. To <laughs> <laughs> um, so that made it easier. But. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, and I just remember thinking about that move afterwards, going away thinking about that move, and then just it slowly sinking in that, yeah, actually, no, no one has the right to put their hands on you, to, you know, that that's indicating, like you said earlier, that, that this escalates into a really bad place. Yes. You know, seeing that someone's willing to do that to you, that doesn't, that doesn't disappear, obviously, unless you run away or whatever, but... You know, if you're in a situation where that's not an option, then that's going to escalate into really bad violence unless you stop that like now. Exactly. I want it can go from I have to stop it from going to a 10 as quickly as possible. Mm. Like I can let it go to a three, but I can't let it escalate past that because it goes from a three to a 10 too quick. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's so interesting. I, yeah. So like, if, if I have that experience, then the experience I imagine of people who are less I definitely don't class myself as a violent person. These two are going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but I have I have situational based it's violence. Been the <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember. Where I was going with that now because I said <laughs> I made that a big violence hole. I'm not a violent person, but. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, for it, okay. So if it takes that long to sink in with me that that's okay, and I'm someone who came from a martial, other martial art background, then for someone that's never come from that background, exactly. and then like you say, has the social norms and constraints that are more prevalent in women, 
Yes. Then it makes it really hard. Oh, yeah. yeah. When I teach women how to do Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu, the biggest hurdle I have with them is either permission to hit hard because women hit a, can hit a lot harder than they think they can. Mm-hmm. I know because I hit harder than most men. Two, two, to put weight on them, to put weight on people in positions in jujitsu. Because there's like, because people have this fear, like, I don't want to hurt anybody. And I try to give perspectives. You know, I tell women, especially if they're moms, what if they did this to your kids? What would you do then? Mm. Women's minds change real quick when I mention their children. Because there's a mama bear instinctive thing that most mothers have be like the moment you touch or do something to my child like there's oh, something that shifts in their brain you know what i mean where they're like oh if someone touched my kids like like someone's getting carried out in a body bag and it's not gonna be me like it's very different yeah. you know and so that's what i do for a lot of women is like just changing um like I try to put it in perspective. Perspective is everything in self-defense. Like how do you put this in a perspective? What's the context? Mm-hmm. Once I had context to it and I give women permission, like this is your right. And I tell them that all the time. This is your right. You're allowed to do this. You're allowed, you are allowed to defend yourself. You have the right and the autonomy to your own body and no one else should be able to do something to your body without your permission. And it's like, this is your right to be able to do this and to hit hard and to like, that's part of like the process. And it's so empowering once women over get over that hurdle of understanding that like someone invaded your personal space and wants to do violence against you without your permission. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's crazy when you say it in words, (laughs) you know what I mean? When you say it out loud in words, you're like, Oh, I should be able to, (laughs) there should be, you know, there should be consequences there should be consequences regardless of what those are there should be consequences to let people go off and do things and just feel like they have ownership to someone else's body without someone's consent and there are no consequences then the, this this whole issue in general continues to escalate as a, on a cultural i think on a, on a societal scale and this is not just women this is everybody now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying I believe in vigilante justice per se, but just that calm assertive energy of like, what's nip it in the bud, like mm-hmm. right away, you know, like, how do we do that? And just like this at making base, how do we get, you know what I mean? Like the, the, even that quick little, like, if I just break your wrist real quick or just make it uncomfortable enough that you want to stop pushing me, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Maybe you just don't want to do it anymore. I've changed it. I let it go to a three and I never let it go past that. Mm. you know because i don't want to feel the 10 yeah you know and that's and i mean and and this is like i said it's a very muddied issue it's a very complicated issue it's it's something that i think you have to come to conclusion with yourself on a morality level of what level you're willing to take this to to protect to protect yourself and your own family on a moral level um there's also the legal the like the legal level you know what are your rights um, I know what my rights are here in the United States. I don't know what the rights are for a citizen to defend themselves in the UK. Um, I know what it is in the state of Virginia. Um, and so like, you know, and, and understanding that this is a decision that you have to make with yourself, your family, your kids, like everybody, you know what I mean? Like, this is something that you just really got to think for, for yourself and decide what's the best course of action for you. Like my mom doesn't train self-defense. She was attacked in her twenties and she doesn't train because she's like, I don't think under pressure, with the adrenaline dump, I could do anything. But she said, I always felt safe because your father was always around and you were always around. So I don't know if we touched on this before we went live on on YouTube and on, on no, recordings. But one of the things we said earlier was about the, the kind of the message, which is, you know, there's no point women doing self-defense or, or martial arts because, you know, if they come up against the man, it's pointless anyway, it's not going to work. I'm fairly confident, Kristen, I've been spoken to a few times, that you could dominate me physically on the mat. It's no trouble whatsoever. Um, so, what I mean, what's your message to, to, to the ladies out there that are contemplating whether they should even try? Well, it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are to be a professional fighter and fight men, then yes, I would say, I would agree with your statement that you shouldn't try. 
but I'm not trying to beat Max Holloway in a fight. Like, you know what I mean? That's not my goal. My goal is to be the best version of myself. Mm. How do I most readily prepare myself for, to mitigate risk, to mitigate the risk of a violent encounter? And so my goal is not to win the fight, but to get away. And I think women are more than capable of training martial arts for the aspect of getting away, but also getting more confident so I feel I can assert myself and set clear boundaries because I'm comfortable with, you know, understanding, being aware of my surroundings, all these secondary things that we don't think about in training martial arts, you know? And so I think people, that's why, like, I, I always find it's really cool when I find really great guys that want me to teach their daughters and they're like, no, I want to learn from a female instructor. I'm like, why? It's the same Muay Thai. It's the same Jiu Jitsu. Like, cause I want her to, my daughter to know it can be done you know what i mean and that's like the other beauty of having a female instructor is that they want to see it's possible you know because you know, once they see it's possible then things are less you know there's less limits so i understand what people are saying like yes if i was to fight a competitive fighter my own weight that's a man if in a competitive setting with rules etc yes i probably would not win but if an uneducated opponent bigger than me grabs me on the street, can I risk grab escape and get away? Absolutely. I a hundred percent believe that a hundred percent believe that because, but, but I, am I fighting? Not necessarily, but am I using what I've been taught? Absolutely. And what's the, um, what I was going to say, what's the kind of the biggest like unexpected benefit that you've, you've, that's happened to you as a result of all your martial arts training for me? Like, yeah. like the, the benefit? Um, unexpected one. What? Unexpected one? Um, I, the fact that I get paid to do it? <laughs> like, that's crazy. <laughs> Who would pay me? <laughs> like, this is bananas. <laughs> I have a job. Like, I have a job during COVID. This is incredible. Like, that would be the most unexpected benefit. Um, I think the most unexpected benefit for me is... I was never expecting to this to be so transformative for me as a person. So I used to have debilitating social anxiety um, and zero confidence, zero. Um, and have, uh, I, I had an eating disorder. I'm very frank about this. I had an eating disorder in high school. I, I, you know, I just, so what this has done for me is completely looked at myself in a completely different way. And I think for women, regardless of what you choose to do this, but what it's given me is not what my body looks like, but what it can do, which has been amazing. My ability to teach and reach people and actually feel like I make real change in, in children and people's lives through the vehicle of martial arts. But that's, the, and also just the confidence and, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you, I'm speaking to you guys over Zoom for the last like almost an hour and a half and I have debilitating social anxiety. That's crazy. Like that, when I tell people I used to have that, they're like, no, you didn't. I'm like, absolutely, I did. I would get so terrified of speaking to people that I wouldn't look them in the eye in my 20s. So what this is, that has been the most unexpected thing is that after you've done jujitsu and you've been in the worst positions possible and you've lost so many times on the mat or, you know, in Muay Thai, I got hit a bunch. Nothing else is hard. You know, what could be harder? You know what I mean? Fighting's easy. Life's hard. But like still, like this is this is a piece of cake. That you know? perspective thing again, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know for you guys. I'm sure it's the same for you. Like it gives you so much perspective to life. That's why I told everybody when, when, when um, we had the lockdown. Just because you're on your back doesn't mean you're not going to end up on top. You know, we, you know sometimes you just got to survive. Okay, we're just going to chill. We're going to survive a little bit. And then we're going to wait for our opportunity to escape. You know, it's a metaphor for life. You know, it's tough, but jujitsu is problem solving. And that's what it is. And that's what we're trying to do here with all of our, you know, with us as a person. Random questions just come in for you. Um, we have some students, obviously, that have suffered COVID. Um, in the time that we've been off the mats, some of them worse than others. 
Yes, um, but one, have you, I mean, have you had students the same? Um, then the question is yeah. basically, you know, anyone suffering with like long COVID symptoms, you know, have you got any advice for those people making their way back to training? Because that's something that we've not experienced. Okay, yeah. So, so I had COVID. I had COVID actually. <clears throat> I had COVID in Oct uh, the end of September, early October. I was very fortunate to um, have the symptoms last about five days, but I know a lot of people, their cardio was, you know, shot um, pretty bad. And so it depends on like the culture of the gym that you're at. So what I said is that um, something master salaries is, is like, sometimes you don't want to put a lot of energy. You always want to have a little bit in your back pocket, you know, for the next class. That's where you have to train all the time. But I think once you've had a serious injury or COVID or um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Greg Nelson's story of him having cancer twice, master yeah. Sowers first black belt, him coming back from having cancer you know, his very, he is a very inspiring story too, about like coming back to training and just surviving, like, and being okay with that. And that's what I would say is like, manage your expectations. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, be, and give yourself grace. That's the big thing. Manage your expectations and give yourself some grace because you're not always going to be the hammer. Sometimes you're going to be the nail. And, and that's okay. As long as you know how to mitigate that and like, okay, can I survive today? Can I breathe and just survive today when I'm getting back into training? Can I walk upstairs today? And it could even just be something so simple. Like, okay, it's hard for me to breathe because I'm recovering from COVID. Can I walk upstairs? You know what I mean? Like sometimes this is like when you get injured, right? You know, you sometimes you're like, oh man, I can ride a bike. Like you're super excited about like simple things. Like I blew out my knee when I was in Thailand and I was like, yay, I can walk this is awesome. <laughs> like, you know, like little things. So I think that's just like trying to give yourself little manageable goals and not try to look at it all in one go when you're coming back from an injury or a disease or even a bad life situation. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So just, you know, attacking it a little bit of time, but it, 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 it was hard for me to come back from COVID just because like, two weeks of isolation sucked. Like I was like losing my brain, but I mean, that was hard for me. I felt terrible when I came back. And so like, you just have to give yourself some grace. Mm, that's good advice. That's good advice everyone's going to everyone do as well. that after a year off the mats anyway. <laughs> well, I was just gonna, yeah, I was going to say that. That applies to everyone that hasn't, like in the UK, that hasn't been training and is coming back and, you know, like take it easy, take it slowly. You know, really? you're not the same yeah, take it slow, like yeah, so that we don't, you know, don't end up with you know, fifty percent of people injured and damaged because they haven't done anything for the last twelve months. Yeah, for sure. Um, but like, it, it's been it's been tough for everybody. Like to say that this last year, year and a, yeah, year has been easy for anyone would be a lie. So it's been tough for everybody. I think maybe as a people, maybe a consciousness shift has happened where we can maybe all be a little more empathetic to our own experiences and understanding that everyone is always going through something. And that a lot of times when we're on the mat, that's that that time on the mat is special because it's not just for our physical health, it's it's for our, for our mental well-being. For some people, this is like their therapy. And so we have to be really gentle with each other, I think, as a people, you know, and especially in this community be really gentle with each other and be gentle with each other's egos. Now, even more so than ever understanding, like now we know what it's like to not have it. And maybe we'll never take it for granted again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's very wise words, Kristen. Thank you. I, I try to, I try, I fake it really well. <laughs> <laughs> ah. um, yeah. Is there anything else you guys wanted to talk about today? Well, I think we've pretty much covered it. Well, like you say, it was a little bit more serious than last time. <laughs> yeah, I had way more jokes last time, man. Yeah. So many no. canned jokes. Now I didn't have any. <laughs> but I think it, I really, I think it's important. I think it's really important. And we could have just kind of stayed quiet about it and not really mentioned kind of anything about it and what was going on. But I think that would have been, you know, not very useful for anybody. Um and to take it from the perspective of jiu-jitsu and, and what you've learned over over the you know over the years of training and everything, I think 
gives people a better insight than us three just rabbiting on about it. So. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you guys bringing me on and really respecting my opinion when it comes to this and, and giving me a vehicle or a platform to speak about it because I'm not usually given a platform. Um, not saying that this community is not amazing, but like actually asking a woman who trains and teaches women self-defense to say like, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. It's kind of important. Uh, and so I think that that's really, the more we can do this as a community and give people who usually don't have a voice a voice, even in this small community like jujitsu, is really going to be beneficial, I think, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully it opens up. I think the whole thing that we probably all identify with is that you want it to open up a sensible conversation. And like you're saying, yes. you want sensible, respectful of other people's ideas. Let's, you know, try and find, you know, try and find a bit of a, I sound like Jerry Springer's sum up now. <laughs> you, want to, you want to try and find like some, some middle ground. Everyone's going to have common ground on it and understanding of other people's situations somewhere along the line. So, you know, the, the media is not helping people. They're going, you know, they're going crazy and putting on the wildest points of view possible, which then flares everybody up because it's clickbait. And hopefully this is a more sensible conversation about it. And it means that other people have more sensible conversations about it and we don't end up in a crazy situation. Yeah, I mean, the best thing you can do is do it on a small scale. So it's my area of concern versus my area of influence. So I try to focus on my area of influence. Yeah. Um, and what can I do in my day-to-day -day life to influence people and, and to help make better people? And I try to do it at the youngest level with age. Like, here's a, this is my favorite example. I teach a little kid's class, like a four to six-year-old class. And one boy, he's five, goes to touch a girl's hair. And I'm like, hey, buddy, you can't do that without asking permission. That's called consent. I said that to a five-year-old. And I know that sounds silly, but I just say that because I'm like, you have to ask permission because like, he, you know, most people make not a big deal of that. It isn't a big deal. Like it may not be a big deal to any because he's five. We all, he's five. He doesn't know any better. I'm like, yes, but you're instilling this idea that you do, you can't just touch somebody without their permission, man, woman, child. You just can't do that. That's called their personal space. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like, I don't care. I can't touch a dude without my per his permission either. It works both ways. That's what I want to be very, very clear about when I'm articulating. It works both ways, you know? And so it, that's why I would say for us to have these reasonable conversations and what you can influence in a day-to-day -day life and have these conversations in a small you know, like, like this versus big media, it's going to make it better for everybody, I think, you know, and realize that we're not different. We're actually all the same, you know, and we're all in this together. You know, I, I think it's going to help everybody. And I just want to say thank you guys so much again for bringing me on and let me, me speak about this because this is something I'm very passionate about, if you could not tell. And it, it means it means a lot to me. Yeah, no, thank you very much for doing it on such short notice as well. So, yeah, no, it's perfect. Um, is there anything you want to promote, talk about? How do people, if they want to come train, what's the deal? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm still booking, I'm booking seminars for this year for the places that are allowed to have them uh, here in 2021. So if you would like to book me for a seminar, you can reach out to me at kristendebrucker.com. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at DeBruckerland, at DeBruckerland, on, friend me on Facebook, Kristen Brucker. And then if you are in the Virginia area, I train, I am the head instructor at Gracie Charlottesville. You can come visit us in Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. I also have a YouTube channel called Kristen DeBrucker YouTube channel. I have free classes on there, free YouTube live classes. I'm also available for Zoom lessons. So you guys can contact me directly. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Do it. Do it, people. If you haven't already as well and you're here, hit the subscribe button for our channel as well. That'd be awesome. Um, give us some star ratings on iTunes, wherever you're listening to this too, if you listen to the audio version. Um, thank you very much for the support as well, everybody that's been listening to the podcast and everything. Um, you know, it's it's been great for us to keep going and keep in touch with jiu-jitsu as well. This is like we our little... We thought we were just going to do about five or six episodes. Yeah, yeah. Episode 28. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you very much. It's kept us in touch with everything and it's been it's been awesome. So, uh, yeah, cool. We'll uh, cut it off here um, and I'll cut the live and we will catch you guys. 